Okay, so again, I am Kim Godwin. With me today are uh, Dr. Karen Hine and Tara Perrin, who are other instructional designers for MTSU Online. And we are going to talk about groups today in D2L and how we can best utilize those in our courses for student success and student engagement, as well as managing the demands of faculty as those demands are increasing with enrollment changes and shifts in sizes of classes. Um, Karen just put the group's cheat sheet into the chat. So be sure to download that at some point. Uh, but if you get out of here and you forgot to download it, um, it is also on the MTSU online um, website, our mtsu.edu slash online. If you go to faculty services, it's under online teaching resources. That's where the group cheat sheet, as well as I think everything else we've ever created is also there. Um, so please feel free to go there, especially if you can't remember how to create something, we may have a resource for you right there. Uh, so check those out and see if there's one that you need there, even if it doesn't have to do with groups this time. So the way that we're gonna do this, this presentation today is a little bit different than some of the other ones that we've done. I'm gonna walk y'all through uh, creating groups in D2L, but I'm gonna do that at the end. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about groups uh, here at the beginning and ways that we might be able to use them. And uh, as we go, if you have questions, please post those in the chat because uh, Tara and Karen are really awesome at making sure that those get answered because um, I fully admit I'm not great at doing that part. Um, so they are really great at making sure that those get answered, but also feel free to just interrupt because um, we're just going to kind of have a dialogue. And if you have some insights or you have some questions, feel free to engage in in this conversation. Uh, so just gonna go ahead and make it happen today. So talking about groups and some of the the reasons that we think that groups are, are kind of important, especially now, um, I think they've always been important, but I think they're even more relevant now. Uh, there's been some things that have happened over the last couple of years in our world that have impacted uh, how our courses are, are flowing and structuring. We have students who are juniors in college this year, and this is the first semester that they probably have a predominant number of their classes being face-to-face. -face. Um, and that is sort of a, like we knew that that was happening, but if you know much about higher education, it only takes about three tries for something to be a tradition forever. We did it once. It's the way we did it last year. We've done it this way forever. Um, that's how we do things because our population changes so quickly. So when you're thinking about that, if if you're looking at our juniors, that means that only the seniors and above had a traditional pre-pandemic educational experience for an entire academic year. Um, well, not even an entire because they're the ones that got sent home. Um, so when you think about it like that, that really does shape how our classes are impacted and how our classes are changed and how our students uh, probably view their learning. It also has impacted us as faculty and how we teach and the ways that we have to engage with our students differently than we might have at one point. Um, much more has gone online, uh, whether that's through a synchronous class uh, that a class that used to be face to face was remote for a hot minute and now we're kind of doing a hybrid model or we've fully embraced asynchronous learning or we are looking at ways that we can really supplement our classes with some flipped kind of activities that there's there's some things that you're going to do outside of class so that when you come in class we're going to do these types of things when we're face to face so really looking at all the different ways that we're doing things has changed a lot one of the big changes has been enrollment. So a couple of years ago, I hear that um, a lot of gen ed classes had about 25 students per class and an FTT would teach five of those classes. So that's a lot. That's a lot of students. And then in, in the last couple of years, those may have increased to 30 students per class. Now, five students in one class is actually a pretty substantial increase but five students across five class is an entire another class so that basically went from it being 
five classes of 25 to six classes of 25. That's a huge increase on faculty and the amount of work that faculty are having to do to maintain and keep up with our students and make sure that our students are having a positive experience. One of those big things that, that I don't know that everybody really thought about and one of the things that we've seen a lot in MTSU online and we've seen through the industry is how people are addressing that forever and ever and ever. Um, the traditional online model was that uh, you had a discussion, uh, they posted on a certain day, and then a couple days later, they responded to two people, and we had a certain word count that they had to meet, and we did it every single week. Um, some of those things have changed a little bit with time, so that's actually one of the things we're going to talk about in a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that that really does go from an old model the ones that are like 30 to 50 people in the class, they aren't big enough to be uh, structured in terms of being a MOOC, which is a massive online course, um, the ones that are hundreds of people, um, but it's actually a little bit too big for the level of engagement that we look for to really create that community of inquiry where students are connecting with each other, they're connecting with you, the faculty member, and they're connecting with the content. When there's too many people it's just overwhelming. It's overwhelming for you. It's overwhelming for the students. It's just overwhelming for everybody. So really looking at how we might be able to help mitigate that for you as a faculty member. So uh, Tara has prepared a couple of questions for us here today that are going to kind of guide us through this conversation. So Tara, what did you have a question? What was your first question that you had for us today? So the first question I'm thinking about is, when you're trying to get a level of engagement and discussions, particularly respecting that diversity um, and engagement part of a quality online course. So when you're trying to do that within a discussion that has 35, 40, or 50 students, how would you manage that? So that is a fantastic question because it's right along what I was just saying and thinking about that in terms of the if you do an initial post and then you do two response posts and there are 50 people in your class, that means every single time that you have a discussion that's 150 posts. So just step back and that probably caused like some sort of physical reaction because it causes that reaction in me. So I imagine it kind of causes a reaction. To other. That's just a lot. Not only is it a lot to look at when it's on your screen in terms of discussion, but it's also a little overwhelming when you log in on the course home and over there on the right hand side, it tells you how many unread you have and it's over a hundred. Like you, when, when mine is over a hundred, I, I, I feel it. I physically feel it. Um, so it's just, it can be really kind of a lot for you as a faculty member. So one of the ways to look at that and one of the ways to think about that is truly to look at um, creating those groups so that it is smaller entities where students are communicating with each other. Uh, it's overwhelming to you to have 150 posts and you are the faculty member. You know what they're going to be talking about. You have developed kind of a, a way that you go about doing things in your class. Uh, for a student to log in and post their initial post, because you may have had that little thing on there that prevented them from seeing other people's. So they are like going in, they're posting their first posts, and then all of a sudden 130 other posts pop up and they're like, I, I don't even know where to start. Uh, and what happens with that is that they will pick somebody at random usually, but they'll pick or someone they've met before, but they'll pick somebody and that will be the person that for the entire rest of the semester they engage with. They are going to get that person's perspective from the first discussion to the last discussion, wrong, right, or otherwise. That is going to be the person they engage with because they were overwhelmed the same way you are by that 150. If you look at that and you think, okay, there are 50 people in my class. How can I help make this more manageable for me and for my students? What about creating five groups of 10 and they communicate within that group of 10? within the discussions. So you're still looking at as many, but you're not having to remember quite as much as as many, because when you go to grade it, you're grading within that small little component of 10 people or eight. I say somewhere between eight and 10 is about where you should have your discussion board because five is a little small. If somebody doesn't show up or 
what if you have three people in a group of five that don't show up? You're not going to have a whole lot of engagement. But if you go to like eight to 10, it's got enough wiggle room that if a couple people don't participate, you're still going to be able to have some good conversation. The cool thing about it is that you can actually do one of two things with those groups is that you can either set them up so that they're exactly the same throughout the entire semester, or you can set them up so that students auto change into different discussion groups throughout the semester so they actually are having more enhanced conversation and discussion because they're getting to know different perspectives and they're getting to know different people uh, so it's not the same group but either way um, it's still a little bit easier for you because it's easier to maintain within that process and within d2l you can also grade things as a group uh, which is kind of awesome that you can go in and look at something as a whole and grade a whole uh, and not necessarily have to go in and do individuals. And as a side on that, even though it's not necessarily what we're talking about, think about what your rubric looks like and what it is that you're assessing. Uh, what type of of rubric are you looking for? What type of engagement are you looking for? What is it that you're hoping to get out of their discussion responses? And that will also make a difference in your amount of involvement that you have to, to do with each one. Um, because, you know, we say that a faculty member really should go in and participate in discussion so that the students know you're there and they're making a connection with you. Well, you know, back to having 50 people, that's 50 individual posts. If you have five groups of 10, that's five. It's five posts instead of 50 because you're posting in the small group instead of every individual person. Uh, but you're still engaging with every student in the class, but you're doing it five times instead of 50. I mean, if you have the time and energy to do 50, go for it. Um, but five seems a little bit more manageable because you can kind of read what's going on in that group and then ask some some leading questions. Uh, have those, oh, this, you know, this point and bring in something else, challenge them a little if necessary, um, really encourage their engagement within that group, but you're only doing it five times. So. There was a quick question about how do you explain to students what the group discussion board looks like? Um, it essentially does look the same. It's just not as many students. You could well, explain to the students yeah. that they're in groups. Right. I'm just curious what that like what is your like actual post? I mean, I understand the concept. I understand that you would be explaining. It. I'm just curious how other people have explained it to students that really connected to them so they understood what the concept is. So in, in my example, and I'm not saying that mine is the, the right way, um, but what I what I do with it is when I, I explain it. Um, in the in their initial discussion board information, but then in my first video uh, about discussions or about the first unit where they're going to really have a, a discussion beyond that introduction discussion, I actually talk about it uh, because I, at least for me, I feel like, and that may just be me because again, a little bit of an extrovert like my own voice, um, so it may just be that I like that and I feel more confident doing that. But from from the feedback I've gotten is that. Once students understand why I'm doing that, it makes more sense to them, and they're not quite as confused about it. Um, I also, uh, within a lot of mine, if it's in a smaller group like that, I don't tend to worry about the um, hide until have posted part because it's a smaller group. So you know if somebody is reading someone else's and posting that someone else's because there's only 10 people in the group. Um, so you don't tend to... The, the fear of let me go in and read everybody else's and make my own is a, at least for me I've seen it's a little bit less when you have a smaller group because it's so much more obvious um so uh that's just one of the things that but it's a lot for me it's just the open communication about why I'm doing it uh and and I've always been very clear that it's so that they can have greater connection with each other and not feel like an anonymous number in the classroom but actually feel like they are in conversations that they would have in an actual face-to-face -face classroom with the people sitting around them. Think, pair, share, right? Isn't that what it is? Think, pair, share? Only it's like 10 instead of a pair. Yes. Um, I've seen, I've participated in workshop where they will place us in groups. So my problem is not as much as, as much about 
uh, making student working groups is how to set them up. Sure. I don't know, I don't know how to build those uh, break that break up break up rooms and assign people. In I, Zoom or Teams or D two L. In Zoom and Teams, I've never seen that in D two L, so I don't know how that works. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, we'll talk about it in D two L here in a little bit. Um, in Zoom and Teams, it uh, it's part of your settings that are in more. That's thanks. <laughs> um, and we can go over that some more. Um, at the end, we can I can sh we can probably show you a little bit more about how to set those up. Uh, in Zoom and Teams, we we might have to practice because we don't. There's only three of us, so we don't set up rooms very often. <laughs> um so we'll we'll look into that but we will definitely talk about how to set them up in just a second Thank you. uh tara did you have uh additional questions that you were going to ask me oh you're muted <laughs> okay my space bar stopped working um <laughs> so often faculty members it's the ones that I work with will talk about group projects and group presentations, and they will say statements like you can't do that online, or it's really hard online. So can you speak to that particular thing about how you can use groups and do online presentations and projects? Absolutely. Uh, I think that they are as important, if not more important now online than they might be face to face. And part of the reason for that, at least to me, uh, is that in in our world outside of college, once they graduate and they go get a job, a lot more of those jobs are virtual now. Um, and not just since the pandemic. I mean, like technology advanced enough that you can have real time conversations with other countries. Uh, so a lot more of what we do is in a virtual environment. Uh, people are not in the same working space. They're scattered all over the country. They're scattered all over the world, but they're still working on projects. So if we are avoiding uh, projects and presentations because we don't know when they're going to get together to prepare it, uh, that kind of leads me to one of my questions of, do you schedule group time in your face-to-face -face classes? Because uh, I never did. Uh, I uh, When I had face-to-face -face classes, I didn't actually schedule group time in the classes. It was part of the assumption that they would find that time as a group to meet outside of class because that's not part of the time that I had set aside for class time. Uh, they find a way to meet. They do the same thing online. They do the same thing virtually. Um, Sure, it's great to set up some options, uh, typically within a class, if uh, there's going to be a presentation or a project, setting up the D2L discussion boards that allow them to initiate conversation is great. Uh, not necessarily require them to continue communicating there, but having that there is an option for them to see, I think is really helpful because it, it prepares them to start that conversation. But with all the the technology tools that have come out, I mean, even just in the last couple of years, but even before that, but over the last couple of years with all the new technology tools, students today, they use Zoom and Teams and Screencastify and Camtasia and all of the things that we may not feel as confident using, uh, but they use them all the time. And they've been using them for a long time now and they feel very comfortable doing them and having a recorded group project for them is is not a strange thing that's very normal and communicating with each other through virtual platforms is very normal so having that in place not only does that give them a chance to have those conversations and practice those skill sets for presentations and projects and things like that you're actually doing it in a way they're probably more likely to do when they graduate and get out in the real world anyway. Uh, so we're really kind of enhancing some of those upskilling and credentialing, micro-credentialing kind of options that are really big in industry right now and are really big conversations in higher education. If we're allowing students to do that, that is a skill set they get to take forward. So we're getting the presentations and the projects that show that they have these skill sets and they're getting the practice. One of the other things to to really think about about that too is that in in a face-to-face -face class when you do presentations 
they tend to be timed. We have a certain amount of time. You do a presentation. Uh, we probably reserve enough time at the end of the semester to uh, be able to do two in a class period. If the class period is about 55 minutes, we can knock out two. Uh, they're usually about 15 to 20 minutes long, but there seems to be a, a good 10 to 15 minute gap in the middle while they figure out how to walk to the front of the room. Um, I, it's always amazed me. Just walk. Um, it always takes forever to get the second one started. That gap of time, it means that students are hearing a presentation of their their classmates. They're hearing the presentation. They're listening to the information. They're processing what's being said. We say, excellent job on your presentation. Class, what questions do you have? And then people stare at you. Um, like you have like seven eyes coming out of your forehead. Um, they just stare at you. Part of that is nobody wants to be the first one to ask a question, but part of it is that it's in a hurry. We want them to get those questions done so that we can get on to the next one. So the next group has time to get their questions done before the end of the class time, because it is a finite amount of time. If we are doing those presentations and they are posting them like in a D2L discussion board uh, or presenting them through some sort of virtual platform, then once they're there, students can watch them and then have the time to reflect and think about questions that they have or how they might relate what this what their classmates said in the presentation to how it relates to what they've learned in the class or questions that they might have about their own presentations or the own experiences so you're giving them actually a greater amount of time to reflect and really synthesize the information and then formulate a response in a way that is very meaningful uh, for students as well as the class discussion. So I guess to me, I think online gives, especially if you have people that are a little more reflective and a little more introverted, you actually are enhancing their learning by allowing it to be in a virtual environment and not putting the time parameters on them to respond. I admit not everyone in the world is like me and doesn't always have something to say. Um, so. That's my thought on that. I saw the so thing, chat going. Is were there any questions about any? No, it was okay. a comment. It's a good comment. It was a comment, okay. not a question about how <laughs> okay. students do meet each other, even if there's not a group project. Uh -huh. um, okay, so now we've talked about some things that we can do in groups, but we we all know that we have the slow roller or the non-participant in groups. So how do we address that with grading? <laughs> what? <laughs> I've never had that happen. Um, yes, there are usually a, a, a couple who uh, do not participate to the best of their own abilities. Um, they could do more if they didn't wait until 11.58 when it's due at 11.59 to begin the process. Um, so thinking about that and how do we do that, if we are using groups, um, and as I mentioned earlier, that we can use groups and do group grading. And so if we're doing group grading, what's great about group grading and Dropbox and discussions is you're grading them one time. And then everybody in that group gets that grade. That is fantastic for your time. But if you have an individual or two that aren't pulling their weight in the group, you want to be able to assess them. There's a couple of things that, that can happen there. Yes, there is one grade. If you have your little rubric set up and you're in, like in your Dropbox and you have your rubric set up and you go through your rubric and you give the group one group grade, it automatically applies it to everybody in the group. But you can definitely go back in and manually override an individual student and provide additional feedback on that one student without it Im impacting the whole group. Um, so that's an important piece of information is that you can individually grade people if they need it. Uh, one of the ways that I tend to do that is that part of the overall grade for presentations and projects, and this is something I've actually seen uh, with several different courses, is to include a peer evaluation that the students fill out on their group members. And you will find out very quickly who did or did not participate. And it doesn't need to be like this huge drawn out process. It can be something pretty basic and straightforward, 
the way that I have seen it so that students actually turn those in, because there seems to be like some fear about that, is that the peer evaluation is actually part of the total grade. And that can also be where you can individually grade a student. Uh, so if say your project is worth 75 points, 60 of those points are for the project, but 15 are for the peer evaluation, that's actually enough that it impacts the grade because uh, that's a substantial enough amount that it will impact their overall final grade. If they're not, if they didn't participate and they're, or they didn't participate well, and their uh, group mates tell you that in their peer evaluation, then they get that score in their peer, they get a bad score and others get a positive score based on what their group mate said and submitting the peer evaluation. Uh, and we have some examples of peer evaluations that if somebody would like some of those, we can definitely send those out to y'all. Um, but we do have some examples of peer evaluations and we have a few rubrics in D2L that are also peer evaluations that we can actually forward to you in, in the D2L common cartridge package. And then you can actually upload it straight in D2L as a, a rubric. I would encourage you to alter it though once you get it because you'll want to make sure that it reflects you and your needs. What other questions does anybody have? Oh, Tara, do you have another one? Um, I do. Hold on. I was looking at the comment to make sure it wasn't a specific question. To Millicent's um, comment also about everyone giving good grades, I am just working with someone where we are using emoticons to rate their peers, and then they have to give an a justification with the emoticon. For whatever reason, it seems that students like to be more honest with an emoticon instead of a word. Um, so uh, that is something I know, Melissa, you're teaching graduate school, so emoticons. But it might be a possibility because, I mean, we, you, we we describe it for pain. We use the right how happy and how sad are you are on the pain scale. So it's kind of the same idea of giving them emoticons to choose from and say, okay, this, this represents this person and this is why I gave them this rating. So that's another way potentially to approach it as well. That's, we'll see how it goes when, once I get done with, with this class. We'll see how it goes. Um, but, uh, right, it's a pretty cool idea. I, I thought I, so. I, do I mean, it. sometimes we come up with good ideas. Um, <laughs> every once in a while. So, right, every once in a while. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about some of the other things that you could do with groups in larger classes. Like we've talked about presentations and projects specifically or having smaller groups within the larger class so that students can just communicate with each other, giving them the prompts. What other kinds of ideas might there be, Dr. Godwin? <laughs> I think there's actually a countless number out there. So we'll just go over a couple so that we really do have time to get into D2L and see how to create a group. Uh, one of the ones that I've seen work pretty effectively is book groups. Uh, and that may seem a little strange and it may not fit into every type of course, uh, but giving students the, the option to choose a book group that they go in and they read and discuss that that book within that smaller group in a, a more in-depth and meaningful way, I think could be really interesting. I've, I've seen that a lot in graduate courses, uh, but it does also, I feel like that would be a lot of fun in like a children's literature class. Like I, I now want to go be in a children's literature book group class and read fun stuff and really discuss them and have those conversations, not just about the book, but also the other components and the structures and how they apply to the different things we've talked about in class. But it gives that ability to have a, a smaller, more engaged conversation about a book. Uh, you can then have them come out and present their information to the larger class if that makes the most sense, like if everybody is reading the same book, great, have them present it to the class and see how the groups differentiated. Did they go in different paths? Did they see, uh, you know, different ways? Or if they are different groups, if somebody is, is studying different components of history or different components of 
um, uh, sciences or things like that, that they could go and talk about different things. Being able to share that with the class gives the rest of the class a wider variety of things to kind of learn about during that semester instead of everything being down here. It's much more like this because in real life, in real life, we do more than one thing. So it's helpful to have kind of a breadth of how to look at and compare things. So book groups are one of those ways to do it. Um, I've seen debates. It does take a minute to set that up. So if you would like to have a an asynchronous debate in your D2L discussion board, we are happy to assist you on that because it does take a little bit more set up than just a traditional group, but we can definitely help make that happen. But it's really cool because you can put some of those same parameters and put some of that same structure that you would have on an in-class debate into a D2L discussion board process and how you could make those happen and those expectations. And students really do have to get in there and 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 have the pros and cons and have those conversations about those things. Uh, and then one of the other ones is one that's not necessarily uh, so much for students as it is uh, as faculty having uh, study groups. So yes, you can set them up as student study groups, but one of the ones that I've really seen, and it's happened a lot more in the last couple of years now that, that most of us have really embraced the, the digital format, uh, is that having a time that as a faculty member, you set aside uh, once a week or, you know, when you know that there's a topic that typically people have a really hard time addressing or there's a lot of confusion kind of with a certain topic, setting aside a time that you announce that time and students being allowed to come in and meet with you. So similar to your student office hours, but it being very strategic on a specific topic you may be spending an hour, you may have zero people come in, or you may have the whole class pop in, but you're spending an hour and you're probably answering some of the same questions that you would have normally answered 50 times. You're answering them one time. And if you record it, you can post it into your class. Um, and then it's right there for the rest of your class to see. So even if people couldn't be in there, they might be able to go back and get that recording and get that information later. So it really actually can save you an insane amount of time if you're strategic about when you do them and how you do them so that students aren't asking a lot of questions. Does that? So speaking of questions. Yes. <laughs> great way. Okay, so we're going, we're in the chat. By the way, the chat's awesome. Um, <laughs> great. So the, it is. So one of the first questions was talking about if smaller groups still allow the flexibility, this particular faculty member um, lets them respond to the topic that they want to, but then they have to respond to someone else who picked a different topic. Mm -hmm. So having smaller groups, would it still allow that flexibility? I would say yes. It also can create more in-depth information if it's a smaller group because they get more into the minutia, if you will, of mm -hmm. the discussion because it's a smaller group of people. Um, so I do think that would still allow the flexibility. Do you, do you, what would you like to add? I, I would agree with that. And that would deal with how you set it up in D2L. So there's a couple different ways to set up groups, especially in discussions in D2L. And one is the forum and then individual topics per group. The other is forum and then topic and then individual threads per group. And the threads per group, you are, you can see others. Uh, in the topics per group, you cannot. So if it's looking at, let's have this conversation over here that's small and this group, but you can still go and see what other people have done later. The threads is the way to do that because that really opens it up to a greater level of variety and they can still see what everybody else is doing. So a lot of that has to do with what's the intended outcome of the activity as to how we would set it up. You know, I'll follow up with the chat there. I think really it's about just uh, doing some guesswork, you know, and you're like, OK, let's see in my on my whiteboard if it was 10. Sometimes I have to like draw lines to people to simulate. Is that going to be flexible enough? And then I realize, OK, for this one, the group actually needs to be eight, it actually needs to be 12. And so for, for me, I do a lot of tinkering um, with who would be able to interact with whom, I guess, um, mm -hmm. before I go live with it. So that helps me out a lot. And um, my board ends up having this like, you know, that meme with the guy from 
is always sunny in Philadelphia, <laughs> really spring going. So to me, that helps. And and then my next um, way I get help is actually I run that by uh, a buddy, you know, so Dr. Cranbill is my, my boss and he, he pretty much sees everything I do. And I'm like, hey, what do you think about this? And he's like, well, that actually that, that math doesn't work because these two wouldn't get to be able to do. I'm like, oh, crap. You know, and I, I often don't catch it until I have a buddy peer review it for me. It's very helpful to have somebody else look and make sure it, we say that's part of why there are three of us, because no one of us is going to see it. We have to show things to each other and ask. We ask each other things all the time about stuff and, like that. And, and like we encourage comment, that. Um, one more follow up there. You know, sometimes your topic is really suited for pick and then respond to whatever. And then you try to do that again for a different part of the semester. And it's like super confusing because the topics mm -hmm. are just so different or something. So it's so it's so neat to have a sounding board with with somebody like in your office mate or something like that. So that's Absolutely. how I, that's how I live and breathe is someone taking a look for me and, and, and basically pulling me off the rails or off the <laughs> edge to say, hey, just to tw tweak this just a little bit, you know. Sometimes we can get so excited that we get so far down the path, it doesn't even make sense to us anymore. Uh, so kind of keeping it managed and reeling it in occasionally, we have to do that too. So yeah, it's good to do that. Uh, do y'all have any other questions uh, or comments or anything before I do a screen share and show you how to set up some groups? We'll have time for more questions after, but I just wanted to make sure. Okay. As she's doing the setup and getting ready to show you everything, I just wanted to mention as well, one of the ways I do work in a lot of business classes, one of the ways that um, we use groups too is for those faculty who have writers or authors that they think are really seminal in their field, um, whether it's a book or if it's research and they want their students to be exposed to those individuals. Um, that's another way that I have seen book groups used and it is also um, at times they have used it um, faculty I've worked with to increase and enhance diversity in their class because they pick different authors for each group to try and think about those things as well. So, so that's a good thing to think about as well when if, if you're able to and thinking about groups, that's a way you could bring in some DEI um, into the classroom too. Which is huge because again, perspective. We learn so much more from each other's perspectives. Each one of us is limited by our own scopes and the more that we can bring in to allow opportunities for students to learn from each other or learn from new experiences. It's just gonna enhance their experience as well. Okay, let's do a quick, this is how you do groups. So if you would like to minimize me in the bottom corner, please feel free to do so. Uh, and you can hear me talk as I walk you through it or you can watch and do it on your own. But I will never be offended if someone isn't paying attention to me while they're practicing doing something in D2L while I'm talking about it. So from a D2L course, you'll want to go to communications, and then you will want to go down to groups. If by chance you are in a class that you have changed your nav bar. Okay, side note on that. Please stop changing your nav bar. It confuses people. But also, if you have changed your nav bar, you can get there from edit course and then go to communication, the communication section of edit course and go to groups from there. Uh, but typically the easiest way to get there is from communication and then you go to groups. Uh, this one clearly is one that I have used samples of before. Uh, so just, yeah, yay, new one. Okay, the way that you do this is we start a new category and you're gonna wanna think about your groups before you set up your folders for drop boxes or your discussion boards, uh, or you'll end up just having some duplicate stuff and doing copy paste. It's not the end of the world to do it if you decide after the fact that you want one, just if you happen to know you're gonna do them, it's helpful to know that up front. Uh, so we will label it and y'all will watch me not spell groups correctly or a presentation because watching people type is the fastest way for them to mess up. Uh, so category name, and then I don't actually do much in description, at least for these. If you have several groups within a course, it's not a bad idea to put a little bit in the description, but you don't need to go into a lot of detail. It really is just a little bit about what this group is for, because they're going to have the information someplace else. The next big part is, is where you will make your first of choices about groups. You have several enrollment types to choose from. Number of groups 
no auto enrollment is when you go in and you set the number of groups that you want to have in the class and then you want to be the one that assigns students. So if you know that all the main girls are in your class and you want to bust them up between groups instead of having Regina George in the same group as Katie, uh, then you need to, if you haven't seen main girls, this makes no sense to you, but you gotta bust that group up and you wanna make sure that there's a, a group diversity, then you will wanna go in and make sure that you actually assign students to groups for these activities. I don't know how often you need to do that. The next one is groups of number. And that's where you look and you say, I want to have groups of eight. And D2L will then take your class list and it will create groups of eight until it runs out of students. It will auto assign them. It does it at random. It's just a mixed group of students based solely on D2L's whim in that moment. There's probably some behind the scenes AI stuff that does it, but it's random. The next one is groups of number. So that's where it you don't really know how many groups you're going to need, but you want each one of your groups to have four people in it. That it gets you to the same place, those two. It's just whether or not you know you want eight groups or you know you want groups of four. Uh, that's the only difference there. It auto enrolls for both of them. So that's the that's just what to know on that one. The first one is you're the one that enrolls it. The next two, D2L enrolls the students for you. The next ones are self-enroll. And that is where you set up the groups and then students go in and select the group they want to be in. So this is really great if you are doing uh, group presentations and projects that you don't, it doesn't matter to you who picks it. They can be in the group with their best friend, that's fine. Uh, it's also really helpful if, uh, like Tara was just mentioning the different uh, authors, students can go in and pick the one that they want to read. Uh, they can go in and select the topic. If you've got, you know, here's the topics that you need to choose from from your project or presentation, you go in and select the one you want. Once it's full, you missed your chance, so you better go select early. I tell them that a lot. Uh, to select early so that you actually do get the one that you want because once it's full, it's done. You have to go pick something else. But that actually also gives them a little bit of autonomy in the course. It keeps some structure for you so they don't end up talking about stuff that has nothing to do with what's going on. But it does give them some autonomy of when and who they are uh, meeting with and what topics they're doing. The only other one to just point out is single user specific members. So that is really if you just have one person and you are setting that up to have individual consultations with students. This one isn't used all that often, uh, but it's in there. So you're likely going to use one of the other three categories. So for this one, I'm going to use groups of number and I'm going to do groups of three. I'm not restricting my enrollment. That simply is that if I had, um, see, I told you I have a bunch of groups here. If I had groups that say, for example, you have a cross-listed class and you wanted to have a group of your graduate students and a group of your 4,000 level students or a group of your 7,000 level students and a group of your 6,000 level students, you can actually create groups in, with that that you can then assign to specific activities and assessments in your class. Uh, so I'm not going to have any restrictions in this one. Uh, I'm allowing it to randomize users. I'm also going to auto enroll new users. So if somebody joins the class after the class has already started, it will put them into a group. I'm going to go ahead and set up discussion areas. I'm going to use course discussion. If you don't want to use the forum that's already there, you simply click the button that says new forum and you create a new forum. And then here is where we talked about that you're gonna create a new topic or that you can attach it to an existing topic and then create threads underneath it. So in this one, I'm gonna create a new topic, which is where each group would have a different topic and the other groups can't see it. I am also gonna set up drop boxes with file submission. 
Dr. Yeah. Godwin, as you're doing this, how um, can you man? We have a question from Sherry about can you manually change a person once the group has been set up? And yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, can. you can. So because I said I wanted a new topic, this is where I get to select. Do I want to create one topic per group or create one topic where the threads are separated by groups? So what Lando was discussing earlier about they can talk to each other, but it still be in one bigger group. The one that's the threads separated allows it to still be in one topic. The one that is topic per group, others cannot see what's happening in your topic. So it really depends on what you want them to be able to do. So I'm going to create one topic per group, create a next. Blah, blah. You would obviously have way better titles and directions and instructions than me. Right down here, underneath your instructions box, and don't forget to put your instructions there. I'm leading as a bad example. Um, right down here where it says individual assignment and group assignment, this is where you're putting that group assignment. This is where it is giving you the opportunity to grade it one time for the group. So you'll want to make sure that you put that in there. And this one, uh, there's already stuff in here. So we could simply just add it to anything, but this is the one that we just created. So it will go under the group that we are just creating today. We want to use file submission, but you can use text submission, observe in person. You can choose how it is you're gonna have it. I like unlimited. I like for all submissions to be kept. And then I'm gonna create. It created a forum, forum and topics, and it created one Dropbox. You hit done. And just so you know, if it ever did something that you don't want it to do, these are pretty easy to delete back out. And so if you were like, oh, that didn't work, you can just delete it back out. It will prompt you to save one more time because D2L likes us to save a lot. Similar to the, they don't like you to delete things. They prompt you to save a lot. Uh, okay, so this is our group. These are the groups that we just created. They're, this is my personal development shell, so there's not a lot of people in it. So it, it only gave us one of three into this group, but since somebody specifically asked about removing people from a group, if you click on your members, you can see who your members are that are in that group. But if you click on groups, Up here in groups, it will allow you to enroll users and enrolling users is also where you can unenroll users. Uh, so you can hit enroll users or view enrollment and you can remove students from a group if you need to right there. You can be the one that overrides it and boots them out if you need to, to do that. If somebody is causing a ruckus or you need to split up a group, you can go in and manually override who's in the groups. You have that authority even if it was auto assigned, which is helpful, I think. So that's our groups. That one's there. If you go into your Dropbox, you will actually now see, it's going to be this bottom one, uh, this sample for grading, and it has this cute little group icon next to it. That's how you do groups. You have a fancy cheat sheet that we gave you at the very beginning, and we will give you again. Uh, and we are healthy, ha healthy, happy to help you walk through any kind of group structure and setup that you have questions about. Uh, but that cheat sheet should walk you through every single step. And we're here to support you otherwise. So I'm going to actually stop my share and then I'm going to turn off our recording. And then if anybody has any questions, we are happy to answer them. Thank you all.